Hi, thank you so much for staying connected to Passionate Life Church and joining us online. Get ready for an awesome message. Good morning. Welcome to church today. My name is Andrew. I'm the lead pastor. I want to thank everybody that is watching us online right now. Hey, thank you for tuning in. If you're going to listen to our podcast this week, hey, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening and staying connected to Passionate Life Church. Man, I am excited today to preach, but also to have uh, missionaries here with us. I want to encourage you to go check them out right after service, grab some food, and go listen to their story, uh, what they're doing uh, in a place where we can't say their names or, or mention where they are because it's illegal um, to convert people to Christianity where they live. And so it just reminds me that we live in a great country where uh, we have the freedom to worship and and now we are so privileged uh, to live in the place that we live because it is not like that in different places all over the world. So I want to encourage you, man, at least just go get a different perspective of what some people, some Christians are dealing with in other places of the world and really how blessed we are as Americans. Amen. So I am not going to recap this series, okay, because I got a lot to talk about today. Uh, If you want to recap, go watch them, okay? They are on YouTube. They're on our website. They're on our podcast. You can listen to them there. Um, But we've been talking about the spirit of fear. And the reason why we've been talking about the spirit of fear is because I believe right now in our culture that The spirit of fear is Satan's number one weapon against God's people. I believe that he has just taken the spirit of fear and targeted believers and Christians and really the whole society and all of our culture is just overflowing with the spirit of fear. We can't turn on our TV or our computer or our phone without seeing or listening something involving the spirit of fear. And so we've been talking about that. And and, uh, I left off uh, in part four uh, about uh, fear being a thief and and fear steals and fear can actually steal our future. And so we're going to pick up uh, relatively right where I left off. And I want to give you the title of the message today. The title of the message today is The Lasting Dangers of Fear and the Power of of joy. The lasting dangers of fear, letting uh, fear, letting the spirit of fear hang out in our lives and stay in our lives, the lasting dangers of that, and the power of joy. Come on, let's pray, and we'll get into God's Word today. Father, we thank you for this moment. This is your moment, God. Holy Spirit, I just pray right now that you'd open our hearts You'd open our minds to the understanding of your word. You got a word for us today. You got a message for us today. So, Father, I just pray that these words would fall on fertile soil this this morning, Lord. God, we just lift up our country. God, we just pray that you'd help us become the United States of America. Lord, we just pray over President Trump, protect him, give him wisdom to lead our country well. Father, we pray over Jared Polis, our governor. God, give him wisdom, Lord. Uh, Help him to lead us the best Uh, that he can, God, give him wisdom, Jesus. Father, we just pray over our our, our city. We pray over the city of Littleton, Father. God, we just pray that this land is your land, Father. God, we just pray for this morning. Again, I pray, I thank you for every person that's in this room, every person that's watching online is gonna listen. Father, I just pray that this would resonate in our hearts and our minds. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, 
Amen and amen. Let's jump right into God's word today. 2 Timothy 1, 6 through 7. This has been our launching scripture. My hope is that you have memorized this passage. If not, you got a couple weeks to do it. I, I hope that this scripture becomes tattooed on your heart. This is the Apostle Paul talking to his spiritual son, Timothy. He says this, This is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. When I laid my hands on you, Timothy, you were filled with the Holy Spirit and power. He says this, For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. And so today, we're going to look at the power that God has given us today. I want to go to the Old Testament. Uh, I want to talk about a story in 1 Kings uh, chapter 18. We're not going to read it today, but I encourage you, read 1 Kings 18 this week in your reading. Uh, man, it's a great chapter. It's about uh, a prophet, Elijah. Uh, we're actually going to read uh, 1 Kings 19 today, but I want to give you some context of the story. I want you to understand the context of what is happening in this story. So in 1 Kings 18, there is a prophet. His name is Elijah. Now, what is happening in in Israel during this time is they have a bad king, okay? His name is Ahab. And how they judge kings back in the Old Testament days is how closely they followed the Lord. Ahab didn't follow the Lord at all, okay? And it even got worse, okay? If it could get worse, it did get worse because he married a woman by the name of Jezebel, okay, who was just straight wicked. Uh, he did it to form an alliance for war in different countries. He did that uh, a lot back then. And, and so why was Jezebel so bad? The reason why Jezebel is so bad, some scholars believe that she was actually considered a priestess of Moloch and Baal. And so what's, what's Moloch and Baal? Uh, this, this was a lowercase g gods uh, that certain uh, places served. They, they would create idols and they would worship these idols, these idols of Moloch and Baal, and they would actually pray to him in, in, in hopes that these idols, these, these gods, lowercase g, would, would bless them, uh, would give them fertility, uh, you know, would give them a good year or whatever. And so let me just give you some context in idol worship, okay? These people actually didn't believe that a piece of wood w could bless them and change their fortune, okay, or a piece of metal. What they would believe is they would create an image, okay, they would create a certain image, and they would ask this deity, this, this demonic force to, to uh, embody that, that idol, okay? So it was a piece of wood, metal, and, and body, and so that would be the way that they would bless their home and bless their, their, their land. Uh, the Babylonians took it another level. They actually created what was called ziggurats. I, I mean, they, they created giant towers in, in hopes to encase these demonic spirits that would live in, in these towers, and it would bless them, bless their land and their crops, and go before them in war, okay? So this is the type of person that we're, we're dealing with here in Jezebel. She, she was really wicked, and so she her, her whole goal is to get rid of all the prophets of the Lord and, and, and create more prophets of, for Molech and Baal. And so she's got about 850 prophets now of Molech and Baal that actually literally sit at her table and eat dinner with her. Now, she's killing the prophets of the Lord, uh, but a guy by the name of Obadiah who works for Ahab has a hundred of them hidden in two different caves. And then there is Elijah. Okay, and so Elijah gets to the point where he's just sick of it, all right? He's, he's just done. He's like, okay, we need to have a duel. We, we need to have a contest to show everybody in Israel who the real God is, who, who the God of the mo most high God is. So he, he gets all of the, the priests uh, from Moloch and Baal together, and he says, look, you build an altar, I'll build an altar. You put a sacrifice on your altar, I'll put a sacrifice on my altar. We'll both pray, and whoever, whoever's God uh, rains fire down and consumes the sacrifice will be the, the one true God that everybody will serve. And so Elijah says, since there's more of you, you go first, okay? And so they build an altar, they, they put a bull on it, they sacrifice the bull, 
and they begin to pray to their gods. And they, they cut themselves and, and, and burn themselves, and they're crying out, they're dancing, they're, they're doing all the weird things that they do to try to incite their God. And I love this about Elijah, and you can read it in, in, in 1 Kings 18. He starts talking trash. Come on. He starts talking some junk, okay? You talk trash when you know that you're going to win, right? Like that's when you talk trash is that you're pretty confident that you're going to win. And he's talking some good junk. He's like, well, maybe your God is on vacation and he can't hear you. And he's like, well, maybe your God is going to the bathroom, right? And he's reading a magazine and he, he can't hear you. And, and, and now he's going after them and they're, they're getting more frustrated and they're cutting themselves more. And, and finally he says, okay, it's my turn. And they they dump water on they dump water on the the, the sacrifice and uh, Elijah prays and it says in scripture immediately God sends fire from heaven and it consumes everything we're we're talking about the rocks get consumed the dust gets consumed by the fire of God now this reminds me okay that I'm so glad that God doesn't give New Testament preachers like me Old Testament prophet powers. Because there are days where I'm sitting in traffic and that person cuts me off. God's in fire. Well, cut me off. <laughs> Come on, it's funny because you know it's true, right? Come on. Like, on the, <laughs> he gave Elisha power to, to command bears to come out and mull people. Come on. Some of you are like, thank God he hasn't given me that power. You know what I'm saying? So there's some coworkers. <laughs> come on, you need to read the Old Testament. It's got good stuff in it. <laughs> and so... All right, back to the story. And so God calls, or Elijah calls God to send fire. He sends fire. It consumes everything. And so Elijah takes all the prophets and he kills them all. He kills all 850 of these prophets. And, and so Ahab runs back to Jezebel and tells her what happened. So we'll pick up the story. 1 Kings 19, 1 through 3. Let's read it. When Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, including the way he had killed all the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah, may the gods strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. Look at this next passage, this is verse 3. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Okay, a couple things to, to pick out. First of all, Elijah just has like an amazing moment with God, right? Like, like how high would your faith be if you prayed and God sent fire from heaven, okay? And, and there's a bunch of other things in, in, this, in this chapter that God does. He, it, it, they're in a famine and he prays and it rains and then he outruns uh, uh, horses and chariots. Like, like God is just doing supernatural thing after supernatural thing after supernatural thing for Elijah. Like he is the closest person on planet earth at this time to God than anyone. So he's having these mountaintop moments with God. His faith is supersized. Like his faith is at an all-time high. He's having these mountaintop moments with God. And something that I want us to hone in and pay attention to today is that it wasn't even Jezebel that came to Elijah. It was her servant. And her servant came and says, Jezebel's going to kill you. She's chasing after you. She's going to kill you. And what happens to Elijah, the spirit of fear jumps on top of him. And this is the first thing for us to be aware of, is that the spirit of fear can transfer through people. Okay, now listen, I'm not talking about deep spiritual things to make you afraid, okay? You're just like, what? You know, should I go to work tomorrow? I don't know, because I know everybody's afraid there. No, listen, <laughs> okay, I, I'm... I'm, I'm going to show you where the power is in a moment, okay? And so that's not why I'm talking about the spirit of fear, but I want us to be aware that there, man, the people that, who do have the spirit of fear, that fear can jump on us. The things that we watch and listen to, that fear can jump on us. I kid you not, a couple weeks ago, 
I watched 12 minutes of CNN, okay? I don't usually watch news, but I'm just like, I need to hear what people are listening to and what they're saying. So I literally watched one random segment, 12 minutes of CNN, and I kid you not, I was filled with anxiety. I was stressed out. I was thinking about cashing out my 401k and building a bond shelter in my backyard. 12 minutes. And it just kind of resonated with me for the next couple days. And that's how powerful the spirit of fear is if we don't get rid of it. If we just let it hang out in our life, it's going to keep speaking to us. And remember, it targets the Spirit of God inside of us. It wants to silence the voice of the Holy Spirit that's speaking in us. It was 12 minutes. And the Spirit of fear was resonating in my heart and in my mind. So imagine 12 hours of that every single day. We're literally, some of us are, are, are literally putting ourselves in fear prisons where we're just allowing the spirit of fear to speak over our lives every single day. This was one time, one servant speaking one thing to the closest guy on the planet Earth to God. And all of a sudden, he's afraid. Look, look what his response is. Then he went on alone into the wilderness Traveling all day, he sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord. Take my life from no better than my ancestors who already have died. So what's happened? Okay, so what happens? Here's the process, okay? He opens the door to the spirit of fear, and the next thing that he does is what? He wants to be alone. He wants to isolate himself right? Now listen, sometimes isolation is good. We need to get alone. Jesus isolated himself sometimes to get alone. It was more um, getting alone to pray and spending time with God, okay? But what happens here to Elijah is he allows the spirit of fear to come on him, and what does he want to do? He wants to remove himself from people. He isolates himself, and then what happens? Depression sets in. Almost immediately, the spirit of fear comes in, he wants to isolate himself and be alone. Depression comes in. And then the next thing that happens is he wants to die. This is the goal of the spirit of fear, right? Satan wants to steal, kill, and destroy our lives. And if we let, this is the danger of letting the spirit of fear constantly speak into our lives, is there's this process that happens. If it can happen to a prophet of God who's calling fire down from heaven, it can happen to us. So he lets fear in, he isolates himself, depression seeps into his heart, and he wants to die. That is what's happening to our culture today. I looked at the, the current CDC stats on, on suicide. And the suicide hotlines have said, we've had to staff, triple staff, because our calls are up some 300% every single day. The CDC has stated, and these stats are mind-boggling. They said over these last three months, and I, this is so, it makes me angry because this is what Satan's doing to our, our society today. They said one in four people have thought about killing themselves over the last 90 days. That's like 60, 70 million people in our country have thought about it. They said something like uh, anybody under the age of 39, the suicide rate, the attempts are even higher. It's closer to, to like 50% over these last 90 days. The Barna Group, which is a, a church study group, they do surveys. They said 33% of practicing Christians before the pandemic have disconnected completely from the church online and physical locations. And of those 33% of the millennials, 50% of the millennials haven't done anything during the pandemic spiritually. Like this is, man, this is what Satan is doing and it ticks me off because he's attacking the believers. He's attacking people, our neighbors and our friends and our family. And if we would just 
Man, if we would just pay attention for what Satan is doing. He's attacking us with the spirit of fear. And we keep leaving the door open to the spirit of fear by the things we watch and listening to and some of the conversations that we just keep having over and over and over again. Sometimes with ourselves. Listen, depression is not from Jesus. Okay, depression and anxiety is not from Jesus. It is from Satan. It is from the spirit of fear to try to paralyze us from all that God has in store for our lives. And I I wanted to show you this example of a guy who's calling fire down from heaven. He begins to struggle with the spirit of fear because he doesn't do anything with it. Let's continue. Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree, which we can, okay, this is evidence that he's depressed. He can't get out of bed, right? He just wants to sleep. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. He looked around and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones in a jar of water. I mean, can you imagine? God is continuously doing supernatural things in Elijah's life. He sends an angel to wake him up and then right by his head is, is just some wonderful baked bread with probably a, a, some honey dipping sauce and a little drizzle of butter, right? Come on, this isn't Subway bread. This is supernatural bread. You know it's the best bread on planet Earth, right? And, and like, he, like God is still doing supernatural things in his life. Even though he's given into depression, even though he's given into the spirit of fear, God is still showing up in his life. So he ate and drank and lay down again. Come on, he's really depressed. Then the angel of the Lord came again. Come on, isn't that like God in our life? He never gives up. He's still coming. He's still knocking. And touched him and said, get up, eat some more, or the journey ahead of you will be too much for you. Let's continue. So he got up, ate and drank, and the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. That was some good bread. Come on. There he came to a cave where he spent the night. Let's go to the next passage. This is verse 13. Now, again, he has this amazing moment with God. I would encourage you to read it this this week um, in in chapter 19. But what I want to pick out of this story is this, is that the Lord says to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Did God forget about Elijah? Did he forget where he went? Was God on vacation? Did God just, did, did Elijah just surprise God? God's like, whoa, Elijah, didn't see you coming. No, God's sovereign. God, God knows the, the beginning to the end of Elijah's life. Why does he say this question? Why, why, why does he say, what are you doing here, Elijah? And the reason why God questions Elijah in this moment is what he's saying to Elijah is, Elijah, you are not supposed to be here. You have gone outside of the will of God. Elijah, you're supposed to be chasing down that wicked Jezebel and lopping off her head, okay? Like that was, that's what you're supposed to be doing. Why are you here standing before me when you've got an assignment that you're supposed to complete? Why are you outside of the will of God? This is what happens when we give into the spirit of fear. It can literally take us outside of the will of God of God. And here's the thing about Elijah, great man of God, great prophet of God. God loves him, ends up supernaturally taking him to heaven with him. But this was the the beginning of the end of Elijah's ministry. Right right after this, God says, okay, Elijah, I need you to anoint this person, this person, and, and eventually Elisha, who ends up taking over for him. It's, it's, Man, we don't, you don't mess with the spirit of fear. Man, you let the spirit of fear hang out in your life long enough and you'll end up chasing, following the spirit of fear instead of the spirit of God in your life. And you'll end up places where you're not supposed to be. But here's the good thing, okay? The spirit of fear can take us out of the will of God, but the power of joy can bring us right back. The grace of God is so good. We can keep screwing up over and over and over again. God keeps knocking. God keeps chasing. 
And so for the rest of our time this morning, I want us to talk about the power of joy. The power of joy. God just hasn't left us empty-handed. He's actually literally given us something, a power to overcome this spirit of fear. Let's read 2 Corinthians 7, 4, and this is the Apostle Paul speaking to the Corinthian church, and he says this, I've spoken to you with great frankness. I take great pride in you. I am greatly encouraged. In all our troubles... My joy knows no bounds. So what the Apostle Paul is saying here is that joy is not circumstantial. Because Paul, Paul ran from his life every single day. Somebody was trying to kill him. They beat him. He was flogged. He was stoned. He was thrown into prison. And what is he saying? He's like, all my troubles and all of my afflictions, it doesn't matter what I'm going through because my joy is not attached to what is happening circumstantially in my life because joy has no bounds. The power of joy has no limits in our lives. Many times happiness is circumstantial, right? We're happy if we're, we're doing good at in our job, in our career, we're, we're happy if our marriage is, is going well, you're communicating good, you're, you're happy if the kids aren't, you know, losing their minds and acting crazy, right? Like, you're, you're happy when you've got money in the bank account, you're, right? You, happiness can be circumstantial. And then a pandemic hits, something that, that easily can steal our happiness, but the Apostle Paul says, no, 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 that's not what joy is. Joy is not based on our circumstance. Joy is a, a power that God has placed in us through the Holy Spirit that overcomes the, the spirit of fear. It has no bounds. It is unlimited. Psalms 5, verse 11 says this, but let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them that those who love your name may rejoice in you. Joy is a, is a refuge. Joy is a place that you can go and be protected from the things of this world. Joy is not circumstantial. I don't believe that a follower of Christ can be walking in the power of God without the joy of the Lord. Nehemiah says that the joy of the Lord is our what? Strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. What is he saying by that? That the joy of the Lord is our strength. It's Man, the whole earth could be melting down. We could be in the midst of a zombie apocalypse and it would not matter because our joy is not affected by circumstance because it comes from God. It comes from the Holy Spirit. And so things can, and, and listen, it's not something that's fake, right? Well, well I'm just going to fake this smile because I'm supposed to have the joy of the Lord. No, 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 no. The joy of the Lord comes inside of us knowing that, man, God is going to give me the strength through my joy to get through whatever I am going through. He's my refuge. Colossians 1.11. Be strengthened. Look, look at these words that are associated with joy. Look, look at these words. Being strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy. Look, look, look at that. Power, glorious might, endurance, patience. How do we get endurance? How do we get patience? We get that through Joy, the power of joy. The joy of the Lord is our strength. That's how we can have the joy of the Lord in no matter what circumstance or situation that we're in because it's supernatural. It comes from 
within. It comes from the Holy Spirit. Let's go. Psalms 94, 19. I love this. A couple of weeks ago, David said that when fear comes, right? Not if, when fear comes. The fear, the spirit of fear is coming after us, okay? It is, will attack us, okay? When anxiety was great within me. So when anxiety strikes us, when anxiety attacks us, right? When anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought me joy. That word consolation means to comfort in the time of need, to comfort in the time of distress. And, and so David is saying, man, when anxiety comes, right, when stress comes, when the spirit of fear attacks, the Holy Spirit literally comes and comforts us with what? With joy. Why? Because joy is a source of power. And when we choose joy over fear, we become strengthened. Many, many of you, you you've, over the last couple of weeks, you, you've made this response to us, is that, man, there's just, man, I just feel, I just have felt different when I've come to God's house. Man, I, I, those of you that haven't been here in, in weeks, but, but you came, all of a sudden you're like, man, just something feels different in here. That's because we pray over this. This is God's house. This is his sanctuary. And we pray that there would be angels at the door that would stop every demonic spirit from coming into this place so you can receive the word of God, so you can be strengthened by the joy of the Lord every single Sunday. So when anxiety was great within me, God's comfort came upon me, and I was filled with joy. Zephaniah 3.17, and I want you to be thinking about this tomorrow on your drive to work, okay? Or some of you that are homeschooling, you need to, you need to be prophesying this verse over your classroom, okay? For the Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty savior. Other translation says he is a mighty warrior. And so I want to get you, I want, I want this picture in your head this week that Jesus is standing over you with a giant sword and he is cutting down everything that the enemy is throwing at you this week. He is cutting every, every demonic spirit, everything that is coming to get every anxiety and stress and fear. Jesus is standing there with a sword. He is a mighty warrior and he's going before us. He will take delight in you with gladness. With his love, he will calm only some of your fears that don't involve COVID. But I, we look at society and we go to culture today and we, we're like, yeah, pastor, that's, that's closer to the truth. No, 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 no. Do, do we believe God? Like, these are the words of God. And God is saying, with my love, I will calm all your fears. Every single one, I will calm them. With what? He will rejoice over you with joyful songs. So what an image. Jesus is standing with a giant sword over you, singing worship songs about you, singing songs of joy over you. Jesus is singing over you right now in this morning. He's rejoicing because you're in his house today. He's rejoicing because you've chosen to follow him. He's singing songs of joy over you with a sword, cutting things down that is trying to attack you. Come on, you can't possibly have a bad week this week knowing that Jesus is singing over your life. Hebrews 12, 2, I'm going to end with this. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Look at this. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he's seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. How does Jesus endure what he endured? 
Like you, I think we've all could say we've had a bad day, right? None of us can say we've had a bad day like Jesus. He's had the worst day that anybody could possibly have. He's betrayed by all of his closest friends. He's arrested. He's beaten. He's mocked. He's tied to a post and, and they whip him and they, they rip all the skin off of his back. They, 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 they smash a crown of thorns on his skull. And then, then, and then he's asked to carry a, 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 a cross up to Golgotha. He, he can't do it. He's so weak. And then when he gets up there, they, 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 they take nails and they stick them through his hands and his feet. Like that's, that's the worst day possible. How does Jesus get through it? He gets through it because the joy of the Lord is our strength. At the center of ev- the suffering of Jesus, at the center of everything that he's going through is joy. He's hanging on the cross and he's bleeding out in, in immense pain and suffering. Billions of faces are going through his mind at that time. Billions of faces. And it's literally the power of joy that Jesus is like, man, forgive them for they don't know what they do, God. It's with joy that Jesus is hanging on the cross. Why? Because he's about to defeat death and sin. He's about to defeat the power of fear once and forever. Listen to me. You can go into Monday knowing that Jesus has already defeated all of your enemies. And our job, you know what our job is? To choose joy. It's the joy of the Lord. It is our strength. It is, it is a source of power that wells up in our soul. And man, as I was praying this week and preparing this week, I just saw joy flowing out of everybody this, this moment, this morning. The fear began to, to leave our hearts and our minds and the, the joy would just begin to well up in our soul and overflow in our minds and push out all the, the, the just the spirit of fear fear and and doubt and negativity and stress and anxiety because that's what the power of joy does. Joy. Come on, choose joy this week. Choose joy this week. Because when we choose joy, we begin to walk in the power of God. See, the spirit of fear wants to get us off track, wants to get us outside of the will of God, but joy shuts the door on the spirit of fear. Joy leads us on the path of righteousness. Joy leads us on the path and the purpose that God has for our lives. Choose joy this week. Come on, let's bow our heads and close our eyes this morning. I'd ask that you do it online too. This is for you. This is for you also. Maybe you'd say today, Pastor, I've never said yes to Jesus, and I need to make that commitment today. I need to experience the joy of the Lord that comes from Jesus. Or maybe you would say, Pastor, I've just drifted from the truth. I've let fear and stress and anxiety consume me. I need need to respond to Jesus today. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If that's you, just slip up a hand. I just want to pray with you today. Yes. Yes, yes, thank you, Jesus. You can put your hands down. And I just ask that we'd all repeat this prayer as we help those making the greatest decision of their life today. Dear Jesus, I thank you for what you did on the cross. And I ask this morning that you would forgive me of all my sin, that you would come into my life and be my Lord and King. And from this day forward, I will follow you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, let's give them a hand clap today. Heaven is rejoicing. Thank you so much for staying connected to Passionate Life Church. If you'd like more information, you can email us at passionatelifechurch at gmail.com. Be sure to like, subscribe, or share this with a friend. Thanks again, and we'll see you soon.